Hi, everybody. Welcome. Good to see you all be here today, members of our SBC community, of our bank community, of Mount Anthony Union High School, and of the Burford Academy. I hope that you'll keep coming. And remember, on February 12th, we have a lecture by the Vermont Poet Laureate City League. I'm an English major, and though my dissertation is focused on rhetoric, composition, and the writing center, my PhD is in English, and all my qualifying exams were literature-based. Why does this matter? Because like all English majors at the time, I was compelled to learn that in the 1600s, Sir Philip Sidney announced in his defense of poetry that the purpose of literature is not just to delight, but to teach. This brings me to the point of today's lecture, which fits into the college's theme for this year, which is look within, see beyond, stories of empowerment and change. Because Megan Mayhew Bergman will attempt to teach us how fiction is an agent of social change. We know, for example, that Kate Chopin's provocative novel, The Awakening, published in 1899, about a woman's artistic, social, spiritual, and sexual awakenings, was written at a time when the movement to give women the right to vote was in full force. In fact, Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote her famous essay, The Solitude of Self, in 1892 with ideas in it very much like those of Chopin in The Awakening, which was coincidentally entitled Solitude before it became The Awakening. <coughs> we also know that Harper Lee's great novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, brought to this country a heightened awareness of what W.E.B. Du Bois called the most significant problem of the 20th century. That is, the problem of the color of <clears throat> Lee's great novel showed us the tragedy of racism and implored us to change our prejudiced ways. Finally, we know that Megan May Bergman, a volume you can read on your program today, is an author whose first full collection of stories, Birds of a Lesser Paradise, has received critical acclaim for its art and for the messages in it about motherhood, family, respect for all living things, and the natural world, and more. We know that in her fiction and in her teaching, Megan reminds readers and students alike that the ending end of all literature, as Sidney said, is to delight, of course, and also to teach us how to change for the better. We're so happy to have Megan back with us today. Please welcome her warmly. Thank you so much, Al, and thank you everyone for being here. I love that I get to do this. I love being an author and having an audience and being able to talk to you about things that I'm passionate about and things that matter to me. So when Al asked me, if I would be willing to speak on fiction and social change, I was excited. Um, most authors, as you will realize, have obsessions. They have passions. They have things that matter to them. And one thing I think about, when I was first, uh, actually in the professional world, people uh, would tell me, when I got up to speak, they would say, remember, your audience is never more passionate about a subject than you are. And I think the same thing is true about your readers. And that's one thing I've come to learn. And that's why I love that I can bring a social consciousness to my work, because I am passionate about it and because it matters to me. One thing I struggled with early on, before I became a writer, when I knew I wanted to become a writer, was that I, I, could, I was working a corporate job. And there's nothing wrong with corporate jobs. My corporate job paid a mortgage for nine years and put my husband through veterinary school. I'm plenty proud of that, don't get me wrong. But I had a creative side that I really wanted to fulfill. And I watched my husband, who's a veterinarian, every day do work that really mattered to him, that really got him up in the morning. And I felt that that was lacking from my life. And so that's one of the reasons I decided early on that if I became a writer, that if I started to put words on paper and I decided to be brave enough to let people read my work, that one of the things I was going to do was to be socially conscious. Because, again, I would be able to put my passion and my ideas into my work. That said, there's a great risk in doing, in doing that. Okay? Um, and I want to talk about that. And the way I've geared this lecture is, is practical. I hope it's something that all of you guys can use. So most people that come to hear me speak either want to write themselves, either casually, or maybe they want to publish, or they're great readers. And I hope that you're one of the three, if not all three. 
if at the very least, I hope that you're all great storytellers at the dinner table. You don't want to be that person who's the bad storyteller at the dinner table, right? Anybody here, that person? Oh, okay. work on it. <laughs> okay, so William Faulkner, whom I know you guys have all heard of, um, wrote one of my absolutely favorite socially conscious stories. It might be a novella. It's also a chapter in his book, Go Down Moses, which is a lesser known uh, work of his. Um, this story is called The Bear, okay? And it is a, a group of individuals that have been traveling to this hunting ground, um, this old growth forest, for many generations. And suddenly with the onslaught of industrialization, this land is changing. Okay, and they feel it. You feel this environmental pressure trickling down to personal pressure. I find that beautiful in work, and it's something that I like to put in my own work. But I want to start this lecture with a quote from Faulkner. He says, the best literature is far more true than any journalism. Think on that. I don't know if I agree with it. I'm saying it because it's controversial, and I think it's something we can respond to. So let me read it one more time, and I want you to hold on to it throughout the lecture. The best literature is far more true than any journalism. Think about if you agree with it and what it might mean, and let's talk about it at the end, okay? Next, just to make this matter to you, I want you to all think about a social issue that's important to you. So if someone said, Tammy or Shar, it's bad to be one of my friends in the audience because I'm calling you, um, you have to write a novel and it needs to be a socially conscious novel. Think about, I'm not going to make you answer out loud, don't worry, but personally think about what is it that moves you, what matters to you, what gets you out of bed in the morning, what makes you infuriated? What is one of the greatest injustices you witness? What is something that you've had personal experience with or witnessed in the world? I want you to think about what that one burning thing is for you. And if you don't have one, you're not paying attention <laughs> in the world, okay? I want you to think about it. Is it women's issues, gender equality, global warming, peace? What, what is it? What moves you? It can be small or big, right? The working conditions, the hourly wage. What, what is it that moves you? And think about it. All right, so we're talking about fiction as an agent of social change. And when I say fiction as an agent of social change, I want to be clear that I'm not making a pejorative statement here. I'm not saying that fiction is better than nonfiction as an agent of social change. What I am going to talk about right now is that it is one of the most important decisions an author makes when they decide if they're going to write fiction or if they're going to write nonfiction. Okay? So let's say we're at a starting point thinking about I have this issue, right? The thing that I've asked you guys all to think about, this thing that matters to me, right? How am I going to share this with the world? How am I going to change hearts and minds? What am I going to do with this passion? All right, so your next thought process is fiction or nonfiction. It is, again, one of the most important choices an author can make, and if you get it wrong, the stakes are very high. You think about it, we can think about a lot of examples like James Frey or, or other authors who, you know, some of these Holocaust memoirs that have turned out to be bogus. If you, if you are setting out to change hearts and minds, and you choose the wrong genre for your work, you say you're writing an act of a work of nonfiction and it is fiction, that's that's a heavy weight to carry. Okay? So this is an important choice and it's it's one that's coming up a lot in contemporary literature, so I want to talk about it. Maybe you will make this choice one day. And a lot of the great authors that we think about when we think about books with a social consciousness, they had to make this decision, right? So to make a point, Catherine Boo, she wrote the book Behind the Beautiful Forevers. It just won the National Book Award, okay? This is, this is the blurb from, from Amazon for, for her book. From Pulitzer Prize winner Catherine Boo, a landmark work of narrative nonfiction that tells the dramatic and sometimes heartbreaking story of families striving toward a better life in one of the 21st century's great unequal cities. In this brilliantly written, fast-paced book based on three years of uncompromising reporting, a bewildering age of global change and inequality is made human. Anawadi is a makeshift settlement in the shadow of luxury hotels near the Mumbai airport. And as India starts to prosper, Anawadians are electric with hope. Abdul, a reflective and enterprising Muslim teenager, sees a fortune beyond counting in the recyclable garbage that richer people throw away. Asha, a woman of formidable wit and deep scars from a childhood in rural poverty, 
has identified an alternate route to the middle class, political corruption. <coughs> little Duck, her sensitive, beautiful daughter, Anawadi's most everything girl, will soon become its first female college graduate. And even the poorest Anawadians, like Kalu, a 15-year-old scrap metal thief, believe themselves inching closer to the good lives and good times they call the full enjoy. But then Abdul, the garbage sorter, is falsely accused in a shocking tragedy. Terror and a global recession rock the city, and suppressed tensions over religion, caste, sex, power, and economic envy turn brutal. As the tenderest individual hopes intersect with the greatest global turns and truths, the true contours of a competitive age are revealed. And so, too, are the imaginations and courage of the people of Anuwadi. With intelligence, humor, and deep insight into what connects human beings to one another in an era of tumultuous change, Behind the Beautiful Forevers carries the reader headlong into one of the 21st century's hidden worlds and into the lives of people impossible to forget. What's one thing you notice about that description? It could be a novel, couldn't it? It's good enough and intriguing enough, human enough. We have characters that want something, characters making choices, right? So do you see the possible similarities between fiction and nonfiction? The book could have written this either way, but she made the choice to write it as nonfiction, and here's why. Three years of research, right? She went and she lived in Mumbai, three years. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. She has the tools to make a good piece of nonfiction. I don't. Guess what? I don't. I have two little kids. I can't live in Mumbai. If I were to write this, if this issue mattered to me, I would have to choose fiction, ethically, I think. Okay? So what you need in any book, fiction or nonfiction, you need good characters. Okay? You need good material. And that's what Catherine Boo went out and found for herself. Okay? She didn't need to embellish. She didn't need to restructure to make compelling arguments about the human condition to move the reader, okay? Sometimes you do, and that's when you write fiction, right? So the truth itself was compelling. That is not always the case. So the thing that you guys were thinking about, the social issue you hold most dear, perhaps you don't have the individual experience to write it in a way that would be compelling, right, as a piece of nonfiction. And that's when fiction does become a good opportunity for socially conscious ideas, okay? So. How do you choose genre? What might you think about? <clears throat> There's a really important argument going on right now about truth, okay? So in books like David Shields' Reality Hunger, which you should read if this interests you, and John Diagata's Lifespan of a Fact, both of these authors in their own way, and I'm vastly summarizing and generalizing here, are essentially saying once you come to the page, once you try to put words to an issue, you are no longer telling the truth. There is nothing objective on the page, is what they're arguing, right? That everything is filtered through personal bias. It is really hard to bring pure, absolute truth to the page. It is even harder if you do, if you go the pure journalistic route and you're writing facts, it's hard to make it beautiful. It's hard to make it compelling. People do it, but it's hard, okay? And John Diagasta and, and David Shields are essentially saying, everything's fiction now anyway. It's all fiction. We don't need this genre distinction. I disagree with that. But it's a conversation that's happening right now. I do believe in using creative license with integrity, and I think you have to do that to write socially conscious fiction. Okay? So what matters to me most, and what I hope would matter to you, if you were to undertake work on big ideas and socially conscious issues, is an author's intent. And that's where you always need to check yourself, just to be casual in language about this. Your intent right, when you come to the page. I still believe a fact is a fact. I also happen to believe that a writer creates a contract with a reader every time they come to the page, right, and establishes trust. And that begins with genre distinction. So to me, if you're going to write socially conscious work, your contract with the reader begins when you decide genre, fiction or nonfiction. okay? So are you telling me facts or are you telling me a story? It's a trust issue. And to me, any deliberate misinformation, one smudge, one lie, you've gone into the realm of fiction. Okay? And I love, when the New Yorker tackled this issue, um, I loved this quote from the end of an argument. It said, altering and cherry-picking details is an easy, hollow game for a writer. The challenge and the art 
lies in confronting the facts, all of them, whether you like them or not, and shaping them into something beautiful. <coughs> so it, perhaps it seems silly to you that I'm harping so much on genre distinction, but I'm hoping that as storytellers you will make good choices when you, when you do this, when you go down this road. So, as the author, you ask yourself, can I tell it straight, or for dramatic purposes, do I need to tell it slant, right? So is it more intoxicating as fiction? Is it more compelling? Does it free you to engage the reader in a different way? Will it protect a source if you write it as fiction? What are your skills as a researcher or a writer? These are all questions you need to ask yourself when you're deciding, am I writing fiction? Am I writing nonfiction? Okay. I also want to make the distinction that it's not a matter of beauty. Some people say that when writing socially conscious work, people will choose fiction because they can make it more beautiful and artsy. That's not true. There are really beautiful nonfiction pieces out there, like Daryl Markham's West of the Night, Out of Africa by Isaac Dennison, the poet Nick Flynn's memoirs, Lauren Hillenbrand's Unbroken, Eric Larson's books, which are written like a really fast-paced novel but are actually factual. Um, there's also a lot of genre-bending work going on, like Leonard Michael's novel, Sylvia, um, which is labeled as a novel but is based on his life. But I appreciate that because I feel that he understood writing about mental illness, which he was doing in this novel, he needed to tell it slant. He needed to take creative liberty, and I think he applied the correct, uh, only he knows, but I think he applied the correct genre label there. And more recently, Justin Torres wrote a book called We the Animals. It's a slim volume, and it's an incredible book. He said he wrote it with the voice, and he's also writing about being um, a, a gay youth in um, a sort of Dominican household. And um, it's incredibly powerful. And he said he wrote it with a voice, thinking he wanted it to be as vivid as if you were spooning a mouthful of concentrated orange juice into your mouth. Right? But he still labeled it a novel, but there are elements of memoir in there. So I, I, genre distinction seems to be really important when we're talking about socially conscious work. So I felt, I felt really compelled to talk to you about that, and I hope that, that you will think about it. So you've now got your issue of choice. You might think about what genre you would choose. Now, how might you compose a book about this? How might you cultivate awareness in your reader? Make your best point. Change the most hearts and minds. So maybe you had a friend die of AIDS and it was a quiet death, or he or she was a private person. Or let's say you're heavily invested in global warming and talking about climate change, but your individual experiences are limited or they're average. Okay? I have lots of average experiences. It's okay. There's a reason average. You know, that's okay. That's why fiction becomes helpful when we need to amp things up, when we need to make higher stakes. Okay? Um, you can't quite find the thing that stirs your passion in real life. So you, you envision a novel, a protagonist who wants to save a particular bird or a particular place. And here's why social consciousness works well in fiction, okay? Because you have a character who wants something, right? You want change, you want awareness, you want something, you want understanding, you want admission, witness, right? You have a character that wants something, and they can't get it but they're trying. That is a beautiful combination for fiction, right? A character that wants something and something is in their way. That is a recipe for tension and conflict and that's what makes a good story, okay? So social consciousness is a good fit for fiction, often, for storytelling, period. So these tensions and conflicts and setups are the stuff that fiction is made of. Often, with a socially conscious issue, you have sides, right? It's never as simple as good and bad, but you have opposing viewpoints often, right? And again, that's tension and that's conflict and that makes a really good story. You must have these. I hate making rules, but 90% of the time you must have these elements at work on your page, okay? Um, so with fiction, you can embellish, you can dramatize, you can amp up sensory details, you can manipulate the reader's emotions and sympathies. Maybe that doesn't sound very nice, but every time you read an author's work, that is exactly what they're trying to do to you, <laughs> right? They are trying to elicit a response from you, okay? Particularly the socially conscious work. You want to make the reader feel something, all right? So socially conscious fiction, what does that mean? Some people might say every novel is a form of social awareness or social commentary. 
So Austin, Oscar Wilde, Faulkner, Hemingway, we're asked to look at their characters, their lives, their setups, these places, their protagonists, their problems, and we're asked to believe them, right? It's a commentary perhaps on job, on place, on war, on peace, on community, on gender, on relationships. Almost every novel has these elements. Almost every novel is socially conscious. So what we're talking about here is a spectrum, right, of possibilities. When we talk about socially conscious novels, there's usually one author who comes up first. Does anyone want to take a stab at who that might be? Sinclair Lewis. Oh, that's a great one. It's not that's it. Excellent. Um, I was thinking Charles Dickens. And, and people will often bring up Dickens, especially around this time of year, right? Because you're all having um, ghosts of Christmas past and Christmas carols sort of lurking in the wings, right? So he was a social critic, um, very, very much so an admitted social critic. Um, he was talking about economic issues, social issues, moral abuses in the Victorian era. He worked in a shoe blacking factory when he was 12. Okay, so he is one of these individuals, an author who had an experience that he was able to translate onto the page in many permutations. Um, his work actually was very powerful in shaping public opinion. And isn't this what you want all social, uh, socially conscious work to do, right? It shaped public opinion, which therefore put pressure on legal reform. I think this is what at its most grand a lot of socially conscious authors are hoping for, but not always. Sometimes it can be smaller than that. But I want to read to you a, a, a portion of Dickens' The Pickwick Papers. It was quite dark when Mr. Pickwick roused himself sufficiently to look out the window. The straggling cottages by the roadside, the dingy hue of every object visible, the murky atmosphere, the paths of cinders and brick dust, the deep red glow of furnace fires in the distance, the volumes of dense smoke issuing heavily forth from high toppling chimneys, blackening and obscuring everything around, the glare of distant lights, the ponderous wagons which toiled along the road laden with clashing rods of iron or piled with heavy goods, all betokened their rapid approach to the great working town of Birmingham. As they rattled through the narrow thoroughfares leading to the heart of the turmoil, the sights and sounds of earnest occupation struck more forcibly on the senses. The streets were thronged with working people. The hum of labor resounded from every house. Lights gleamed from the long casement windows and the attic stories, and the whirl of wheels and noise of machinery shook the trembling walls. The fires, whose lurid, sullen light had been visible for miles, blazed fiercely up. In the great works and factories of the town, the din of hammers, the rushing of steam, and the heavy clanking of engines was the harsh music which arose from every quarter. Humbling, <laughs> as a writer, to read Dickens' work. Um, what do you notice? What, what are we making a commentary about here? What are we setting up? The industrial revolution. Exactly, exactly. We have the setting here, the hallmarks, the pressures of, the sensory details of the industrial revolution. He's doing some stage, some beautiful stage setting here, right? And and it's not lofty. He's gotten away from big ideas like mercy and hope and struggle. And we're down in the nouns and, and the actions. And I want you to think about that. He's making it real. He's constructing a reality. The Greeks call this mimesis, right? This emulation of reality. And this is what Dickens is doing here. Okay, so we have rods of iron, wagons piled high with heavy goods, right? We're, we're, we're in the real. Also, the key here, which Dickens is using, that is incredibly effective, is that he is on the human side of this. We're not dealing with data, with economics, with principles, with legalities. We are talking about problems, but we're talking about the human side of problems, okay? So yes, many novels, um, observe society, but I don't think you can say all novels are equally socially conscious, right? And that's the point I wanted to make with that passage. It's not work about economics, it's work about the human heart, and that's that's different. Um, there is a spectrum, though. If we were to think about racial issues and some common novels that we hear about, um, we have, I think, a difference in objective when we think about Gone with the Wind, right, versus Toni Morrison's work, or Carson McCullers, or Harper Lee with To Kill a Mockingbird. The author in these books has a different intent, right? So there's a spectrum, right? Um, so E.L. James or a book about, you know, some female friends having Mai Tais at a beach club, right? Not so socially conscious, or perhaps 
perhaps. Um, I've seen people uh, online try to categorize fiction as engage fiction and escape fiction. It's pretty apt, it's fine if we're making generalizations, right? Books that engage us and books that, that give us something to escape to. And I'm not personally ready to draw a line in the sand about what I think makes a book socially conscious or engaged fiction versus escape fiction, but it's one of the quick ways to think about it. Um, but I think a socially conscious work is loosely aware of politics. We feel a socio-political pressure in the news, okay? The protagonist problems reach out and touch a larger issue in the world. The creation of, of a novel or any story that you're telling at the dinner table or on the page is a series of opportunities and it's a series of choices, okay? And the socially conscious author is always thinking about those. So in doing my research for this lecture, I came across a great passage um, by a writer who said, essentially only novels can provide moral insight into the complexity and ambiguity of real life circumstances. Okay, so only fiction can give you sufficient context for understanding crucial aspects of the human condition. Novels can do wonders for your moral sensibility and your social awareness, right? Have any of you ever had that experience, stepping into a book that suddenly enlightened you or brought you closer to a problem? Any, any suggestions? Any ones you want to throw out to the group? Yes? Ironweed. Okay. What else? We love it. We love it, exactly. Yes, very much so. And I love the ones out that you mentioned in, in your introduction, uh, particularly um, Chopin's The Awakening. I thought that was, that was a great suggestion that I hadn't been thinking of. The yeah. yellow wallpaper. Oh, you're just taking it. Yeah, you don't want to talk. All right. Um, anyone else? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Exactly. Sinclair Orwell, right? Okay. All right. So, as readers, we respond to the realities that a novelist creates for us, right? There is research showing that kids, that children who read fiction, develop higher levels of empathy. And isn't that the real point, you know, or, or part of the efficacy of or what makes socially conscious work function? Is empathy, right? Your ability to sympathize with the character. Okay, so you want a certain awareness of a, a problem, possibly a moral one. We don't want to get into calling it too cleanly of a morality tale, but in some cases this, this is what it's about. The novelist John Gardner writes in On Moral Fiction. He says, in a de democratic society where every individual opinion counts, literature's incomparable ability to instruct, to make alternatives intellectually and emotionally clear. Intellectually and emotionally clear to spotlight falsehood, insincerity, and foolishness. Literature's incomparable ability, that is, to make us understand that it ought to be a force bringing people together, breaking down the barriers of prejudice and ignorance and holding up ideals worth pursuing. Literature in America does fulfill these obligations, he says. Also, think about it. Literature is one way of passing down history, of moral lessons that we've learned, of culture, of connecting contemporary generations to prior ones. There is ethical and political potential in what we read, right? So I ask myself, do we need socially conscious fiction to help us see and to help us understand and to help us feel the weight of a particular problem, perhaps one we do not own ourselves? And yes, I think we do. Um, online, I found um, an author, Arthur Blostein, who wrote of young people. He said, the superficiality, the alienation, the escapism and the hollowness are a result of a steady bombardment of confusing and deadening messages designed to reduce us to passive consumers. And so I would say socially conscious fiction is an antidote to this, i.e. engaged fiction, right? I think we're going to, I think we are seeing an uptick in socially conscious work and socially conscious contemporary work in both YA and adult literature right now. I think there is an appetite for it. Um, and there are a host of contemporary writers that are interested in it. I think some of this has to do with the previous um, 12 years of election cycles that have sort of made an activist out of all of us, right? Suddenly, there feels like there's a great need to divide us for us to understand what camps we're in and what issues matter, right? And I think we sometimes go, sometimes us authors go blazing to the page with that information in mind, and I think readers bring in this emotional baggage to the page as well. But. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure if anyone in this room has read Jonathan Franzen's Freedom. Anyone read that? Yeah, very socially conscious novel, right? Um, big social awareness about um, population issues on the planet and conservation and I think gender roles as well. Um, Zadie Smith's Northwest, which is a, a very new book that came out this fall, which I've just finished reading, I thought um, extremely socially conscious. Um, we have Jhumpa Lahari, Kiran Desai, talking about the immigrant experience. Um, again, friends and, and Smith. So we've established that social conscious writing is a thing, right? So I want to talk about someone who's a linchpin in this movement, someone who many of you have probably read, Barbara Kingsolver, right? She gives annually the Bellwether Prize for Fiction, okay? So this is a, a prize for fiction that rewards socially conscious novels. So we have Kingsolver as an author who is sort of blatant in her allegiance to being defined as a socially conscious author, right? She's ready to get behind this. So I want to say this is a risk. I believe in it and I admire it, but I want to talk to you about the risks of doing this, okay? So here is a review of her book, The Lacuna, from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. It quickly becomes obvious that the lacuna, meaning a missing space, seeks to amplify the story of well-known 20th century events from the perspective of the downtrodden, the liberals, the free-thinking artists. Her instrument for this ambitious story is the half-American, half-Mexican shepherd, an alienated, sweet-voiced, closeted gay man. Shepherd moves through these events uncomplainingly, always looking outward, writing down his observation from his liberal perspective. In Washington, D.C., he witnesses the bloody bonus army riots of the Depression. In Mexico, he becomes the plaster mixer for the muralist Diego Rivera and is befriended by his temperamental wife, the artist Frida Kahlo. He is also Leon Trotsky's translator when the exiled Soviet official and his wife hide out in Rivera's house from Russian assassins. And in the end, after he settles in Asheville, North Carolina, and achieves success as a writer of historical potboilers, Shepard bears witness to our familiar Red Scare story as he appears before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Kingsolver builds her novel with Shepard's diaries, memoirs, letters, book reviews, and congressional transcripts. From all this, her character-moving voice rises gracefully, thoughtfully, glitting with wit. Yet, his eye, although detailed, sometimes naively misses shades of gray in characters. Here lies the novel's flaw. On so big a canvas, the complexities of thought, reason, and emotion that impel human behavior are glossed over at times. So nuances go missing. Government conquerors, businessmen, and media are bad. The poor, the socialists, the artists are good. The result is a sad predictability and a loss of surprise for readers. Okay? So when you write socially conscious fiction, here's my number one rule. It shouldn't feel that way. Okay? Your ideas and politics should never eat the story alive. Right? It cannot matter more than your characters. That's the thing that draws us into a novel that makes us care is a character. We have to believe in this character. We have to see what the character sees. We have to feel what the character feels. And it must be Again, here I go making rules. Largely, it must be character-driven, not idea-driven. When we have something that's too idea-driven, again, we lack nuances, we lack complexity sometimes, and it lacks heart, right? So if you want to write something that moves people, your best bet is to focus on character, always. Does that make sense? Yeah, believe it? I do. Um, okay, so plus ideas and politics are tricky, right? you are more likely to alienate your readers with politics and ideas than your character, a believable character, making statements and actions, okay? I'm not necessarily worried about alienating readers. I think you should write what you want to write and what you think is important and what's true to you and what's true to the world, but it's, it's a consideration the way you get those things onto the page, via your character or via the author's heavy-handed presence in the wings, okay? So remember, this is something that I've, I've come to realize. Discovery on the page, feeling a character's discovery, is so much more appealing than certitude, than feeling like sides have already been established, the world is already the way it is, and this character is good and not bad. Okay? So honoring the complexity of the situation, honoring the complexity of the sides, revealing what's at stake in a way that makes us care about the character and the character's choices. A character's choice 
is always attractive on the page. We want that's what keeps us reading is feeling a choice, feeling the narrative energy that a, that a choice grants a piece of work. Okay. So you never want socially conscious fiction to feel too set up, to feel inevitable that the sides have already been established and there's you know that review it said there's no surprise for the reader. You don't want that. You want discovery. I think in most cases. Okay. So you have to trust your reader, but you also must understand that readers are savvy and they will see through anything that's overly convenient as far as the setup goes. One of the great opportunities, though, with socially conscious fiction is to make the real more real. And I think this is a little bit of what Faulkner was getting at. Um, what the critic James Wood calls hyperreal sometimes. It can also test the hypothetical, which I think is what we're seeing a lot now with apocalyptic fiction. There's a huge uptick in this sort of setting and scenario for, for work, right? And I think that's because a lot of authors are test driving these sort of scenarios because it's perhaps become more real to some, some people that, that this is in humanity's future, right? And so there's a sort of test drive going on, this sort of modeling. Make it real to us. Make it matter. Make us see consequence, perhaps. I don't want to speak. I don't necessarily write that sort of work, but I... I, I I see the sort of social consciousness in it, in that way. Um, like Cormac McCarthy's The Road, has anyone read that? That's when, when I think about, I, I am a believer in global warming, and when I think about sometimes worst case scenarios and hundreds of years from now, and when I let myself get scared because I have two young daughters, that's sometimes what I'm seeing in my head because Cormac McCarthy has made this sort of apocalyptic, burned out world a reality for me. And I've actually found that incredibly effective for me personally. Um, it, it illuminates consequence. It models scenarios and it elicits a reader's empathy. Life will be like this. This is what's at stake. This is what could be lost. This is what you might feel like. This is what you might see and how you might feel. Right? Here's another tip. When, and this is, this is for you as a reader. My suggestion is not to read socially conscious fiction or any fiction autobiographically, or read a character's thoughts as those of the author. An author might take on a persona or present a character in a certain persona that illuminates all that is wrong with the world or something incredibly negative or very bad choices. This does not mean the author believes this. This means the author is illuminating something this way, okay? So we have Juno Diaz, um, an incredibly celebrated writer who writes with a lot of machismo, right? This doesn't necessarily mean that he's anti-woman. I've heard him speak about this. This is because he wants to illuminate the sort of talk that goes on behind closed doors among his peers. Okay, um, Tim O'Brien, who is someone we're going to talk about, is known very much as a war writer. Okay, He's written these gorgeous pieces, particularly this book, Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carry. Um, this is it's an incredibly moving book because it feels real, and he does have the experience to make it real, to, to give that, that dose of reality there. Um, I want to show you a video. So being known as a war writer his entire career, he was recently given an award that surprised him, a peace award. Okay, should I tell me when to press play? Okay. All right. We're warming up. You guys staying awake? Enough? Some of you? Okay. Okay, here we go. Now you're really going to go to sleep. Okay, here we go. It seems we're, as a culture, or maybe as a world, we're surrounded by pressures to sanitize war, to dress it up, glorify, think of the Veterans Day parades, the 4th of July, and what you see on television. Um, and that is, uh, that, that stuff contains elements of truth. There is self-sacrifice for men who go off to battle. Uh, there are acts of great valor and courage, but it's not the whole story. The whole story includes evil, day-by-day day nastiness that's not 
You don't witness on television, you don't get in movies, and you very rarely get in books. And hour by hour, it's like being dipped in crankcase oil. Sin after sin after sin, usually of kind of modest proportions. By modest, I mean kicking around a teenager, or peeing in a well, or shooting a chicken that belongs to some old farmer. Or a little less modest, burning down a house. And we can go up the scale to full-scale atrocities. The role of art, whether it's poetry, fiction, or nonfiction, screenwriting, is to press back against this hardened carapace of insulating us from the realities of what war is. Uh, no matter how righteous the cause, it's still sinful and evil. And it contains acts of sin and evil on a daily basis. <coughs> this isn't to say there are times when we don't have to fight back against fascism and bullyism. But there are a lot of times when we're making wars when perhaps we ought not to be doing that. We pay our diplomats for a lot of money and then they'll earn it. <laughs> you know? Mr. Holbrook sure as hell did, didn't he? Uh, and for me to get a thing with an award at the end of my career, uh, with, the, with the word peace in it, if I've been called a war writer my whole career. And uh, I think of myself as a peace writer. And I've always thought of myself as a peace writer. And I, I'm sure that my colleagues up here are all in agreement about that, that yeah, we display the ugliness and the brutality, the obscenities of, uh, of war as a way of contrast against that, that, that alternative, that shy, unbragging word peace. We're at peace in this room. But you, we didn't think that. You didn't walk into this room, and I didn't. But we are. But if this were a war happening around us, you'd know you're in a war. It would be right in your face, and you wouldn't doubt it for a second. And so you fight back. It's like this, as you said, it's fighting against that contrary thing. And sometimes you fight back through displaying uh, those unknown ugliness. I mean, that's the best I can do. So the first time I saw that, I choked up right there with it, and I was right there too. I'm high up the yeah, I have a problem with this. I cry a little for sports games and all sorts of things. Um, so to me, that was one of the greatest testaments to why write socially conscious fiction. I mean, could you feel his passion and his emotional stake? I mean, and I find that really compelling. It's compelling on the page in his work, but it's even more compelling for me to hear him state his intent um, and the feeling that he took risks writing it. Um, so, for me, it's one of the greatest risks I've taken as a writer. Um, it, socially conscious work can often, I've been labeled as an eco-feminist, which, sure, I'll take that, that's fine. But it, it can make you feel a little marginalized sometimes. Um, and you also, for me, I've worried about coming off as shrill if I really tack on uh, perhaps a little too hard to a social issue. Um, and also earnest, which is sort of a bad word in writing. I think you would rather be edgy and gritty. You can look at me and watch me getting choked up at a video and see I'm not that edgy and gritty. I try really hard, but I'm not. <laughs> not what I have to offer the world. But um, there, there are risks. And if you, if you go there, your viewers and readers know you're going there in most cases and, and will oftentimes take you to task for it, um, if, if that so calls. Um, so, one of the things I realized, though, as soon as I started to become published, and as soon as I got the guts to actually call myself a writer and I had real work out in the world, I thought, I have an audience. Wow. How am I going to use it? So in um, 1858, Dickens wrote of the importance of an individual and a writer's social commitment. He writes, everything that happens shows beyond a mistake that you can't shut out the world that you are in it, to be of it, 
that you get yourself into a false position the moment you try to sever yourself from it, that you must mingle with it and make the best of it and make the best of yourself into the bargain. So there's something that I've struggled with. There's something to me, it seems, that's almost narcissistic about being a writer sometimes, that you think, wow, I have something to offer the world. I have something to say. I have a voice. It's this weird compulsion to put more of yourself and your views out into the world. I'm aware that that is a little narcissistic. Um, and there is sometimes a feeling of self-indulgence when I sit down to write. Um, but I also have feelings of spiritual malaise and melancholy and worried about the world I've put my children into. And socially conscious fiction is one of my coping mechanisms. It's one of my antidotes. It's one of my ways of fighting back, of feeling like I'm doing something constructive. And I've gotten responses from readers, largely positive, occasionally not positive, that have shown me that, that my words have made an impact. And that is the most rewarding thing that has happened to me as an author. Um, so the instruction, this is, this is a, a quote from Voltaire. He says, the instruction we find in books is like fire. We fetch it from our neighbors, we kindle it at home, we communicate it to others, and it becomes the property of all. Also, when I need a nudge, I think of the title of Edwidge Danticat's book, Create Dangerously. I sometimes ask myself, what feels uncomfortable? What feels like the stakes are high? And sometimes this is the universe's way of telling me, maybe I found the right thing to write about. It doesn't feel blah, it doesn't feel average, it does feel dangerous. So writing itself is an act of witness. It is record, it is an attempt, it is an opportunity, and storytelling is one of the greatest and the oldest arts, and sometimes I feel a personal mandate as an author to make my work matter. So call it old-fashioned, and maybe I can't get the easy childhood morality tales out of my head, the Bible, Grimm's fairy tales, everything that was stuffed in before I was six years old, right? We're, we're sort of programmed this way to respond to this, these elements in fiction. Um, action and consequence. And so sometimes I wonder, should I go there? But I've decided, yes, I should. So going back to Faulkner, who said the best literature is far more true than any journalism, what do you guys think? How do you respond to that? I don't need you to say yes. I'm just interested in your thoughts. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> fiction gives you a tool. It gives you a tool that allows you to examine something multiple angles and, and the entertainment and the, the entertainment of the characters show them how you can adjust your thinking and have to look during the characters in order to achieve that enlightenment. Yeah, it's modeling, isn't it? And you think about it, sometimes when you're writing you can think about it cinematically. I love what you're saying about perspective here because when we go through life we have all our emotional baggage, we have our biases, we have our unique silos in our individual experiences, and we, we plow through our choices on a sort of single track, and we were not necessarily um, inclined to take risks. But reading a character, on the other hand, who's experiencing things, who might be inclined to take that journey. Um, I think we do that um, in movies, and I think we do it in fiction. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, I think reading fiction, um, you get a taste of someone's soul, and ideally, taste, taste, you know, it, it touches your soul also, as opposed to information, facts, yeah. and conclusions already drawn. Yeah, and I don't know about you guys, but as a reader, I crave that. I love that feeling. It doesn't always happen in every book for me, but when I do get it, it happens perhaps once or twice a year. I, I really covet it. I really value it. What other responses to the lecture or questions? Yes. So given what he, he said, what Faulkner said, <coughs> What do you think about Hunter Thompson, <laughs> right, as far as what's the truth? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a Hunter S. Thompson scholar. Um, I like to think... I don't think, think he'd want a scholar. Right, I don't think he would either. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that, too. Um, I always think that fiction or writing is a big house, and we need it all. I... Um, Edward Abbey, for example, who I think shares some things in common with, with Thompson in the way that curmudgeonly and uh, willing to take risks and be radical and take us places maybe that we don't want to go, um, there's a place for that. I'm, I'm glad it exists. Um, his sort of gonzo journalism, the way you're talking about it, I think it deeply influenced fiction. 
Um, I mean, Tom Wolf being one of the ways, one of the avenues that it has. Um, people taking facts and, and running wild with them, and, you know, making a good story from it. And I guess at the end of the day, what I'm excited about is a story that can be gripping and that can be perspective changing. And I think he offers tools for doing that. Maybe not easily digestible tools for everyone, but God bless him, right? <laughs> What other responses or questions, ideas, feedback, book suggestions, anything? I love conversation at the end of lectures. I know there are a lot of good minds in this room, and we're excited for whatever you have to offer. Yes? I was interested that you mentioned uh, Jonathan Franzen's Freedom. Yeah. And uh, one of the protagonists in that, the main male protagonist in that book, is uh, socially conscious, but uh, not you know, comes off as rather ridiculous, and yes. it's a hard portrait, I think. Almost a so, cautionary tale in some ways, right? Yes, yeah. and so I was wondering uh, if you had thoughts about why it's so hard to write good, socially conscious characters, and why those characters often come off badly in fiction. That's a really great question, because there are some character prototypes in these sorts of novels, aren't they? A lot of them are like the idiot savant, you know, sort of like the of mice and men. Um, you know, you have someone that is disadvantaged, perhaps, um, intellectually, or um, whose capacities are reduced, and they teach us a lesson, right? Like, that's sort of a, a socially conscious trope that's, that's pretty well played out. I think if you go there, readers, readers have been there, done that. Um, I think the... Um, Walter, who's the character we're talking about in Friends and Freedom, he is so um, eager to live a principled life and to live and die by these principles. He doesn't believe in, in procreation. Um, he uh, really wants to save birds. He completely despises house cats being outside. I mean, he, he's, he really craves a principled existence, and yet he can't master it himself. And he's socially awkward, and it does seem like a cautionary tale. It is not a happy ending for Walter, per se. Um, yeah, maybe, right? <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the cast of characters in socially conscious fiction is so vast, but I think it is hard if, if it's overly clear that we're trying to be taught something. I think the best an author can do is make a complicated character, is make a complex character who makes mistakes, who learns, who makes choices who is on some sort of path of discovery. That's the kind of character that's interesting. I, th I think we believe flawed characters because we are flawed ourselves. That's the best I think socially conscious characters can be. I'll have to think on that question some more, though it's a good one. Any other responses, questions, ideas, book what suggestions? What do you think about uh, Parker, not to say like Jeremy Brooks, who would take uh, a novel and then try to March was a tremendous novel. What an achievement that is. Um, and Geraldine Brooks is incredible because she is a trained journalist. And I think you feel that obsessive, intense sense of research, even in her fiction, which I love. Yeah. Um, and it's just for me, anyway, it was interesting. People say, I have two kids, I can't do that. So I think she's fiction. Right. She's done a lot of research. She has. Um, and I, I've heard her speak about it, actually. Um, she, I, I went to one of her readings in Northshire, and she, and she also chose one of my stories for a Best American short stories volume that she edited. She's been really kind to me. Um, she was talking about how she had actually been captured in one of the foreign countries where she was doing journalism, and she was being held prisoner, and she realized she was old, she might not be able to have a child, and she decided she wanted a child, and she was going to put her career on hold for a little while and then do that. Seems like she took a small pause and then was able to reinvest herself. I like to think of myself as inhabiting a pause right now. Um, but I do think research, sometimes if you over-research and you're not skilled, it can make a novel feel overly sterile. Other times, if you're a skilled researcher and you know which details to pull, you make the world real and thus believable and it's incredibly effective. Hemingway always said you should know the tip of the you should know not just the tip of the iceberg but the base so the audience doesn't see knowing you know do a backflip over this chair knowing 
everything that's not seen on the page, which research accomplishes and gives you, I think is important in establishing that baseline of reality, even if it doesn't appear in the book. A perfect, <clears throat> perfect example of something that you would think would be socially conscious is Moby Dick. Mm. It's a story about chasing a whale, and yet yeah. it's there. Yeah. It's there, and you have to give the reader something to, to into it yeah. as you read. Yeah. You know, I, I think sometimes, I've heard somebody make the case that saying we read Melville when we're too young, and we, and we don't know how to process the humanity in his work. Absolutely. And the older I get, the more I think that might be true. Yes? Did you think that Hemingway was a socially conscious writer? Absolutely. I do. His, I, I first got introduced to Hemingway reading his collected stories, which I think is a shame because the first volume of stories he put out is called In Our Time. And it's tiny and it's very cultivated. There are these very short chapters that he wrote right after coming back from the war. And you can feel the post-traumatic stress seeping through those stories. And when they're put together as a very cultivated volume, they're, um, you know, like we were talking about um, Justin Torres in the mouthful of concentrated orange juice, they have that quality that distilled down to their essential truths. Um, the, one of the first stories in that book was called On the Key at Smyrna, and it talks about um, these sort of two opposing sides at a harbor town, and um, I think a, a boat of Greeks are leaving um, a harbor, and they realize their ship is too heavy, and so they break, they break the donkey's forelegs and toss them into the ocean. And that's the parting image in that story. It's just a bunch of donkeys drowning in the water with their forelegs broken. And to an animal lover like me, that killed me. Really lasting image. But you can see this sort of subjective valuation of life going on in a lot of those stories. Um, some of them with characters like Nick, his main character that goes through a lot of the stories, is suffering from this sort of trauma and this processing and discovery about the world. Um, and his Old Man in the Sea. I read that in high school. That's another one of those books that I read when I was younger, and then I read so differently when I was older. Um, the, the passages about the Marlin and the Marlin's mate, um, I found excruciating, but really compelling. Hemingway gets beaten up on a lot, and for good reason in some ways, but I love him. <laughs> so we can continue this um, in the room next door. You're all welcome to stay for the session. Um, the books. Uh, switch. <laughs>